What's up, buddies? Welcome back to Data Driven MQB. Uh, we're taking a break from PCV stuff and other things to talk about the camber curve of the Mark 7 platform. Honestly, this is a pretty simple concept, and I was kind of hesitant to give it its own video, but it sets the tone for the next one, so here we are. For starters, what exactly is the camber curve? It refers to the rate of camber change or the rate at which the wheels tilt in or out based on the wheel travel. So it's not the static amount of camber, you know, it's not going to be what you read on alignment sheet, but how much that number changes as the suspension goes up and as the suspension goes down. Uh, the curve is not perfectly linear, and so we're going to take a look at that in just a second. Uh, if you've already lowered your car, you probably noticed that you gained some camber from doing that. That's because of this. Um, I will be comparing OEM ball joints versus the 034 RCO ball joints strictly because one, I have them, and two, the RCO ball joints are, they offer the most roll center correction out of all the options available on the market. The white lines have a little bit less, which I've got a pair of those to play around with at some point too. Um, so changing the roll center has a pretty big effect on the camber curve. Um, obviously that's not like a strict reason to get it, but it's a pretty nice side effect. So I would just document it here. As mentioned in the previous ride height video, I took measurements of my fender to the center of the hub at stock ride height as a baseline, and then removed the entire strut assembly, removed the spring, reassembled everything minus the spring back onto the car. This allowed me to jack that corner of the car through its full range of motion without the spring in the way with an angle finder stuck to the brake rotor, which was torqued down to keep it flat against the hub. The angle gauge was zeroed at 364 millimeters center of hub to fender as my stock ride height reference. And then it was raised and lowered, uh, and I raised and lowered the suspension from ride height to full bump and ride height to full droop, notating the angle finder readings every quarter inch of the way. I used a tape measure basically as just a pointer on my bump steering gauge while making sure the gauge stayed level. I actually ended up doing this three times and took the average of numbers recorded for calculation purposes. So what did those numbers look like? For starters, here are the raw numbers that I obtained averaging out the three times I ran the gauge through its travel. In an attempt to average out human error, I went ahead and I plugged all of these raw numbers into this graph here to obtain a trend line and check the coefficient of determination. That's this R squared value right here. Uh, closer to one is more accurate. I'm pretty happy with, you know, 99.95 to 99.97% as far as this line formula being a fit for the model. So I fed those trend line formulas into this third spreadsheet where you can see the stock ride height camber change on the left, and I made the right side selectable for ride height based off of, you know, how far you're lowering the car because all that happens is the curve doesn't change just where you're starting out in the curve. So it just changes your zero reference point. All right. So just to reiterate, these charts are strictly for showing camber gain relative to whatever your static camber is at ride height. All right. So I will post this chart to the website. I'll put a link in the description below, but essentially what's going on here from all of these numbers that I've taken when you go from stock ride height to lowered with no other changes, you know, having the same stock ball joints, going to lowered with the same stock ball joints, it doesn't hurt the camber curve, but you're starting off in a different place of it. So you're starting out higher in the camber curve. So you do gain a little bit of negative camber just from lowering the car. We all know that. But as you have, you know, one and a half inches of bump, you're not going to gain as much from there to there as you do from there to there at a higher ride height. Not a big deal, but something to be aware of. Now, going from stock ball joints to the RCO ball joints, that physically changes the curve and it improves it as far as you know camber gain goes. And it actually goes both ways you gain more camber in bump and you also gain more positive camber in droop, which can be advantageous on a, uh, on corner exit where your inside wheel 
is drooping out a little bit. So it might potentially help a little bit there as well. Over here on the right, we've got a summary that kind of shows you going from, depending on whichever ball joints, going from OE height to lowered or going from a given height and changing to the ball joints and the net change from that one thing, that one thing, or going across, or if you do both items, both going from stock ball joints to RCO ball joints and OE height to lowered, you follow the chart down to the bottom right corner. Now, with these ball joints, for anyone wondering, about three quarters of an inch of lowering is the break even point. That is where the geometry has essentially been restored to stock or just slightly better than stock. So, somewhere in the 0.75 to one inch range of lowering, I think, is probably about the sweet spot for having these ball joints installed. And I have some measurements down here at the bottom just for rough reference in case you're curious. I do think there's definitely some margin of error, probably about five millimeters or so, just because it can change a lot based off of the tires and wheels and the amount of camber you have. And then there's also the question mark of, you know, how accurately you might be measuring things. So take this stuff here with a little bit of a grain of salt, but I just put it there for reference. This is one reason why the first video in the series posted was on ride height and knowing our available usable wheel travel. Basically, we only have about two and a half inches of bump travel to play with in stock form before lowering. And that's giving the benefit of the doubt, you know, with some trimmed bump stops where we might be using just a tiny bit more of it than in stock form. So looking at these numbers, we can draw a few conclusions. Number one, within the confines of a 245 wide tire on my nine inch wide wheel with stock fenders, having only the fender screw mod um, when everything's pushed to full bump, we can see that the car never actually starts losing camber within its usable range of travel. The rate of camber gain slows down as we approach the bump limits, but it never actually inverts. It's never actually going toward positive. So even with the lower control arms well past parallel to the ground, which is often cited as the tipping point, the camber, it's always gaining negative camber. Um, the reason for this is because our struts are not placed directly straight up and down. So as you can see from my lame doodle, not drawn to scale with the struts being angled inward as viewed from the front until the lower control arm is at a 90 degree angle versus the lower ball joint to the strut. Number two. If you lower the car more than about an inch, even with the ball joints added, it's only going to be the same as or slightly worse than stock. These are very small numbers and realistically we are nitpicking, but it's something worth understanding. If you lower the car more, the camber curve is now worse than it was at stock ride height on OEM ball joints. Number three also shows why lowering the car gains you some negative camber. In most cases, you'll get about negative 0 0.2 to 0.3 degrees just from lowering the car one to one and a half inches. I've said it before that getting more camber is one of the best ways to make the car faster on track. That said, I think that lowering the car specifically to hit a given static camber target is not the way to go about it. Get your camber in other ways, extended lower control arms, camber or camber cast or top hats, or probably the best way to start is with some Club Sport S knuckles. They're spendy, but it's an OEM Volkswagen part that has no real hit to noise, vibration, or harshness. It also has the added side benefit of because the camber is added via the knuckle, it's machined into the knuckle, it means that as you turn the wheel, your camber that you have sitting in a straight line carries over across the steering axis the uh, because the steering axis inclination and the included angle are also modified in the process of you know adding camber to the knuckle so out of all those options you know what you use to hit those camber targets that you might be looking for will most likely be dictated by rules if you're competing in anything all right so we established that these ball joints are really good for just adding camber in general and it also helps the camber curve which is always a welcome thing on a strut car they do have one downside, and that is bump steer. Most people aren't going to notice it, and that's fine. The fact is, it is there though, so we are going to be looking at that in depth 
on the next video, which is probably going to be a few months because of just lots of stuff going on. And frankly, I'm getting kind of burnt out doing videos and stuff like this. Um, but essentially, I've got a few solutions, one of them being off the shelf, one of them being a custom machine solution to correct that bump steer. And we are going to try and make it great on track. I will say I've done a couple autocross events with these things and it's fantastic there. You're not going to notice anything there. You're not going to notice anything on the street. Um, if you're on like a perfectly smooth track and you're not taking exit curbing, you're probably not going to notice much of anything there either. Um, so we'll kind of talk about all the different things that affect it or and the things that might affect the feel of bump steer because I noticed one pretty simple change that had a massive effect on how the car felt in the next video. So until then, take it easy. Check out the website, datadrivenmqb.com. Check it out on Facebook. Um, yeah, I'm probably going to start getting a lot lighter on the videos and probably focus more so just on articles on the website. So go there. Uh, check it out. There's a lot more information there than what's just on YouTube here. So till then, take it easy.